None of us are extraordinary, exceptional individuals. We're just common people with an uncommon desire to succeed. If you hope to complete the swim, you will have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. It's designed to break a man. If you only fix the surface, you will never get through Hell Week. The pain for a moment went away. Time froze. I knew if I quit right now, I'll forever be a quitter. So one day I was having a conversation with my twin brother. He's like, Branch, you've got to be kidding me. Seals, like, are you, you're not being serious, right? I'll, I'll admit, I, I don't even really know much about it, but I know one thing. There is no way in hell you could ever do that. I mean, let's face it, these, aren't these guys supposed to be, I don't know, world-class warriors or something? Like really tough guys? You are not tough at all. Again, don't know much about it, but I am pretty certain seals aren't nerdy, sniffly, emotional guys who cry during a Clorox bleach commercial. So let's just forget we had this conversation and stick with your nerdy finance job. Well, now I knew I had to do it, right? This is a true story. Literally a week later, I quit my job and my buddy, whom I'd been training with, moved up here to Crested Butte, Colorado, where we trained for an additional six months for five hours a day at 10,000 feet altitude to get into the best physical condition that we could. Then in early 2000, joined the Navy, and after a couple months of basic training, was on a plane headed out to sunny San Diego, California, where we would begin our journey. I can tell you with exact certainty and clarity, like it was yesterday, that I have never been more nervous in my entire life than the day I stepped foot into the lobby of the Naval Special Warfare Training Center. But of course, at this point, there was no turning back. I had to be all in. It takes 18 months and costs about $3 million to acquire one SEAL. And that doesn't count the millions of dollars and years of arduous training once you actually make it to a team. That 18 months is broken into various segments. The first segment is six months long and called BUDS. Another one of our acronyms, it stands for Basic Underwater Demolition SEAL. BUDS has a 90% failure rate of highly capable candidates. None of us are extraordinary, exceptional individuals. We're just common people with an uncommon desire to succeed. So imagine those types of activities going on for months and months at a time. And then the irony is that the training just gets more difficult after that. So the third week of BUDS, the third week of this 18 month training pipeline is called Hell Week. And I assure you it's a lot worse than that sounds. It's designed to do one thing, simply weed out those not committed to the vision of becoming a SEAL. You do not sleep for an entire week. You run the equivalent of multiple marathons while wet and sandy inside and out. This is called getting a sugar cookie. It sucks because the instructors make a concerted effort to ensure you get the sand on the inside of your clothing so that it strips the flesh off your body as you run. It's like wearing sandpaper inside out. You swim dozens of miles in the open frigid ocean. You run with heavy logs, heavy boats, heavy backpacks. You run the obstacle course multiple times a day, endless calisthenics, brutal beatings, all while battling severe bruising, cuts, lacerations, stress fractures, cellulitis, broken bones, things that seemed uncomfortable or things that seemed almost seemingly impossible to become a part of your everyday life. And that winning mindset of persistence and determination reminds me of a great quote by Martin Luther King Jr. that says, if you can't fly, you run. And if you can't run, you walk. And if you can't walk, you crawl. But no matter what, you keep moving forward. In the SEAL teams, we have an ethos, a creed that embodies our culture and our values. And a similar line from that ethos says, I will not quit. I persevere and thrive in adversity. And if knocked down, I will get back up every time I am never out of the fight. And that winning mindset is how each and every one of you, all of us, can continue to take point in our own lives, to push the confines of our comfort zone, to push the limits, to take calculated risks, to succeed and win, and to be all in all the time. If you think about that, that mindset, that winning mindset, winning here is a conscious decision. You will make up your mind whether you wanna pass or you're gonna choose to fail. Keep moving no matter what. Find an excuse to win. You can push yourself further than your mind or body ever thought possible. 
Bud's training is based on the rule of seven. When your brain is telling you that you can go no further and take no more pain, you can go seven times longer, seven times more, and push yourself seven times harder. And again, that's why very few people make it through this selection process. I wanted to tell you guys a brief story about trust from my Bud's class's Hell Week experience. The students have no idea when Hell Week will commence. The anxiety, the anguish is literally eating away at your soul. And as a way to uh, inspire us and motivate us, our class leader, who is uh, the highest ranking officer in your class, he read to us the St. Crispin's Day speech from William Shakespeare's Henry V. And he read aloud those famed lines that say, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers, for he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. John died four days later. We were four and a half days into Hell Week. There were only about 30 students left of the 250. We were in full gear, no fins, in an Olympic-sized swimming pool doing relay races. Four and a half days into Hell Week, you're hallucinating so violently, your body is so brutally beaten, it's more of an evolution in controlled drowning. Long story short, John suffered a massive heart failure and drowned in the pool right next to us. But again, we were hallucinating so violently and so exhausted at that point, nobody had any idea what was going on. So they ran us back across the street to the Special Warfare Center and they put us in the classroom where we waited for a couple hours. And after a couple hours, the door opens and the instructor staff walk in and with them was the commanding officer of BUDS at the time. He walked to the front of the room, turned around to address the class. He said, gentlemen, listen up. Lieutenant John Scott was pronounced dead at 1 a.m. Lieutenant Parado, you're taking over. And he said it with that level of candor, I believe purposefully. He paused for a minute to let that sink in. Then he said, gentlemen, get used to this feeling that you have right now. This is what it's gonna be like in the teams. And you will lose teammates. You have to learn to control your emotions, stay focused on the mission, and trust each other no matter what, especially amidst adversity. And it was a bit of odd foreshadowing because he really had no idea how right he really was. Literally four months later was 9-11. And that's when we all knew we'd be going to war where trust would be at a premium. And although Navy SEALs are widely known to be the most elite and feared special operations fighting force in the entire world, we've been living in a constant state of VUCA, of pain, of loss, sacrifice, and disruption in our post-9-11 reality. Yet how have we continued to persevere, adapt, and lean into that pain and sacrifice to fight and defeat a very dangerous and decentralized enemy? In large part, it's due to our very well-defined and distinct organizational culture, a culture where every single person pushes the limits and boundaries of their comfort zone every single day. We get comfortable being uncomfortable, or as we say in the SEAL teams, we embrace the suck. Same thing when I made that decision to transition from corporate finance to start training and join the Navy to become a SEAL, a total mindset transformation. I had to think about the reality of the world around me in a totally different way. Everything had to change in order for me to achieve that lofty goal of a program that has a 90% failure rate. And any time in our life when we have that vision, that vision and that lofty goal, and the SEAL teams, we say, you gotta eat the elephant one bite at a time. We break the big goals into bite-sized chunks, making them less daunting and more achievable. Navy SEALs can only be forged in adversity. Every single person in this room has and will continue to face various aspects of adversity throughout your entire life. But again, as you know, it's what we do and how we react in the face of adversity that builds our character and defines who we are. The trust you have in yourself to fulfill the promises you make to yourself to achieve those goals, to be disciplined and accountable. And like accountability, trust is the bedrock of any successful purpose-driven life. It's how you fuel the drive to achieve those goals. It builds resilience. Resilience is the foundation of any life lived outside your comfort zone. It is a privilege you must earn every day. We too, all of us, can embody that winning mindset. And each and every one of you can take away from this how to embody that winning mindset to get comfortable being uncomfortable, to win, and to be all in all the time. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, 
and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. To pass SEAL training, there are a series of long swims that must be completed. One is the night swim. Before the swim, the instructors joyfully brief the students on all the species of sharks that inhabit the waters off San Clemente. They assure you, however, that no student has ever been eaten by a shark, at least not that they can remember. But you are also taught that if a shark begins to circle your position, stand your ground. Do not swim away. Do not act afraid. And if the shark, hungry for a midnight snack, darts towards you, then summons up all your strength and punch him in the snout, and he will turn and swim away. There are a lot of sharks in the world. If you hope to complete the swim, you will have to deal with them. So if you want to change the world, don't back down from the sharks. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the munchkin crew, we called them. No one was over five foot five. The munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African American, one Polish American, one Greek American, one Italian American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out paddled, out ran, and out swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good natured fun of the tiny little flippers the munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last laugh, swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. The ninth week of training is referred to as Hell Week. It is six days of no sleep, constant physical and mental harassment, and one special day at the Mud Flats. The Mud Flats are an area between San Diego and Tijuana where the water runs off and creates the Tijuana Sloughs, a swampy patch of terrain where the mud will engulf you. It is on Wednesday of Hell Week that you paddle down in the mud flats and spend the next 15 hours trying to survive the freezing cold, the howling wind, and the incessant pressure to quit from the instructors. As the sun began to set that Wednesday evening, my training class, having committed some egregious infraction of the rules, was ordered into the mud. The mud consumed each man till there was nothing visible but our heads. The instructors told us we could leave the mud if only five men would quit. Only five men, just five men, and we could get out of the oppressive cold. Looking around the mud flat, it was apparent that some students were about to give up. It was still over eight hours till the sun came up. Eight more hours of bone chilling cold. The chattering teeth and the shivering moans of the trainees were so loud it was hard to hear anything. And then one voice began to echo through the night. One voice raised in song. The song was terribly out of tune, but sung with great enthusiasm. One voice became two, and two became three, and before long, everyone in the class was singing. The instructors threatened us with more time in the mud if we kept up the singing, but the singing persisted, and somehow the mud seemed a little warmer and the wind a little tamer, and the dawn not so far away. If I have learned anything in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope. The power of one person, a Washington, a Lincoln, King, Mandela, and even a young girl from Pakistan, Malala. One person can change the world by giving people hope. So if you want to change the world, start each day with a task completed. 
Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. But if you take some risks, step up when the times are the toughest, face down the bullies, lift up the downtrodden, and never ever give up. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. And what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. I have all these scars on my brain from growing up, from, you know, being abused, from suffering through life, from having to learn disability, from stuttering, from having a, just a really bad childhood. And so all those memories, I had to cut open that scar and go into it. And that was a hard process for me to do. Not only was that a hard process for me to do, for me to have the courage to share that with people, you know, because I'm the so-called toughest man on the planet. So they think. Tell us about some of the defining moments in your childhood that actually framed that experience to being a nightmare. Well, my dad was a person that, um, he was an alcoholic. He was really big on being a powerful man. And he had two different sides of him. No one knew anything about the inside of that house. The inside of that house was, was horrible. It was evil, it, you know, like the evil monster came out to play. But once he left that house, he was the nicest, person on the planet so no one knew you know who this guy was so um the scarring started happening inside the dungeon and my dad didn't really believe in us going to school he had a family business and the family business was a skating rink and also a bar so my dad owned the, it was called the vermilion room was the bar and the skating rink was called skateland so from the time i was able to walk i was working that, that i'm skating rink and i worked it from like nine o'clock at night until like 12 o'clock in, you know, in the morning, pretty much. That's what we did. You know, I'm, three, I mean, you know, I'm four years old, scraping gum off the, off the skating rink floor, doing stuff like that. Me and my brother and my mom. Once the skating rink was shut down, the bar would open up. The bar would be open from like midnight to like four o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. Once that closed down, we'd go upstairs and clean the bar. So by the time you work like this, you know, I'm a young kid, it's time to go to school. So most of the time we didn't go to school. So we missed school a lot, but thank God for me, I didn't like school anyway, with a learning <laughs> disability, with a stutter. You know, I had white splotches all over my skin from being stressed out, um, hair, you know, passive hair falling out at a young age. And once my dad got drunk, that's when the nightmare began. And you know, he'd get drunk, he'd get violent. And uh, we got beatings quite regularly, you know, probably at least once or twice a week. And, and the beatings weren't like, hey, I'm going to give you a whipping because you did something wrong. It was like, hey, I don't feel good today. And you would get beat for that. And my mom got a lot of the beatings and it would just trickle down to me and my brother. So that, that foundation of life that I didn't have, that's how it started off for me. And it's progressively got worse. So when you have a horrible foundation, it's like building a house on a fucked up foundation. This is what you're going to get. You know, any kind of uh, earthquake or something happen, the house is going to go down. Sometimes, you know, it doesn't even take an earthquake. It takes a little windstorm. So that was me. I was just a little windstorm away from breaking. So what happened in, in my life was we start to get, I call it like the rucksack. A rucksack is a pack that you carry in the military and you put all your stuff in it. Your radios, your food, your water, all that stuff you get to carry in the military. That's your rucksack. It's a backpack pretty much. As you're growing up, we all have a backpack. Most of ours, hopefully, is empty, you know, and what we put in it is all the crap we go through in life. That's what is in the backpack for the civilians, and we carry it around with us. We have to break the barriers within our minds, within the world, and it starts with yourself. The brain is the most powerful thing. The mind is the most powerful thing that we have. It's not your phone. It's not the computer. It's not anything. It's your mind, and if you can tap into that, you can come from the, from the daggone roots of hell and become such a great seed, a powerful seed that can grow into some great daggone garden. You have to look at suffering as almost like I look at failure. To succeed, you must fail. In failure and in suffering, all the answers are in there. Go in there, go into the suffering. Go into the pain of your life and say, why did this suck for me so bad? Why am I afraid of all this stuff? 
Why have I shut down the whole world? I guarantee I'll tell you why you shut down the whole world. It's in these nooks of the suffering within your brain, in the scarring, are all the answers to why you are on the couch feeling sorry for yourself. Don't just say, I'm afraid to jump off an airplane. Mm -hmm. What makes you afraid of it? Study it. That's why I studied my mind, why I became so powerful in the mind, because I realized I was weak. So instead of running away from the mind, I dove into it and said, what is making me weak? Oh, this makes sense. I came from hell. I came from a place that beat me down to nothing. So systematically, one by one, I went back and met every single person in my mind, every situation. I went one-on-one -on -one with them again in my mind and said, okay, let's now revisit this. And that's how you do it. The brain protects you, but it protects you so much. It doesn't allow growth. You find yourself when you are the, at, when you're not comfortable, when you're not comfortable on a daily basis. And that's how I started to grow. Like I said about the mind, it wants to put you in that nice 72 degree temperature with, with everything right there. It wants to be in that nice with a little massage therapist. That's where your mind wants to be. Doesn't want to be, and we're gonna talk about Hell Week. So it doesn't want to be in Hell Week. In Hell Week, I, I was in three of them. I finished two of them in one year. Only person to ever do that in still history. There's been people who, who, you know, who, who have gone through a couple of Hell Weeks, but in like five years, six years, seven years, eight years, I did, I was in three in one year. They say it takes off three to five years of your life. So Hell Week is 130 hours of continuous training. You might get two hours of sleep. And what it does is it's designed to break a man. If you only fix the surface, you will never get through Hell Week. Because what it does, it starts to bring out these demons. Because even though there's a lot of yelling and stuff like that, there's times where it's very peaceful in a very eerie way. So the first hour of the 130 is breakout. They're shooting guns, it's loud, it's noisy, your mind is in chaos. When your mind's in chaos, you can't think. So you're having fun. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, we're in Hell Week, we're Navy SEALs, or trying to be Navy SEALs, we're badasses. Then what they do, and I don't even think that they understand what they're doing, but I studied the mind. It's perfect, it's psychological warfare. They go from an hour, the first hour, when you're going crazy, the second hour of the 130, they put you in the cold water. It's called surf torture. Now they don't call it surf torture because it's a kinder, gentler word. It's called surf acclimation or something like that. <laughs> Whatever. Everybody's getting soft. <laughs> so they call it surf torture for a good reason. They put you out there. No one's quit yet. It's only been an hour. Maybe a couple of guys have. And you're in the Pacific Ocean, which is never warm. You're all linked arms. You're sitting there and the waves are crashing over you. I went through winter hell weeks, which is cold. The Pacific Ocean is like 50 degrees. It was 49 this particular night in my third hell week. And what it does is it makes your mind flip out. We've been doing this now for three weeks, being in this water. But for some reason now, the water is colder than it's ever been. It's not. Our minds are fragile. We can process a day. It's hard to process 130 hours. Mm. There's no end. There's no end. So the mind starts to ramp up. So you're sitting there, it's quiet. No one's yelling at you. You hear the ocean, and you're freezing. And your mind goes spastic, starts to think, I have another 129 hours. You're not going home. You're getting yelled at. You could be frozen. So you panic, you freak out, and you want to quit. What I realized about the mind is those people who can be in that time and embrace that time and be in that moment and not allow the mind to go to 129 hours on hour one. It's the control that we don't have in our minds. It's the control that you had to have for three months when you're miserable, when you're suffering, when you're laying on the floor, when you're doing all the disciplines it takes to be a monk. You cannot think about the whole process, it will make you, it, it, will, it will make you so insanely crazy. It's impossible. It's inhumane what I'm about to do to myself. You have to be able to break all these big, humongous, painful things in life down to the smallest molecule because that's all the brain can handle. The brain can't handle 
hours and hours and hours of suffering, but it can handle right now. I'm in the Pacific Ocean and it's very cold. And this is what I'm doing. Every day I tell myself, I used to believe I was the weakest man that God ever created. So now I believe that I'm the hardest human being that God ever made. I don't care if it's true or not. It's the most important conversation to me. It's the thing that drives me every day. It, it, it's the one thing that keeps me going every day is that you must constantly be that man that you want to be. Fresh out of high school, attending a local community college. I didn't have any real big plans. I wasn't passing any of my classes. Now the end of the year is coming up. It's time to take finals. And I didn't study for these tests. And as I'm pulling into the school parking lot, I think that's where I was really confronted with it. Like it hit me like, hey, I'm turning out to be a loser. I mean, the kind of guy that no young person wants to be. I'm not making it at school. I'm sitting there in my truck and I think I come up with the perfect plan. I know what I'm gonna do to turn this all around. I'm gonna go become an Alaskan crab fisherman. I'm thinking, <laughs> deadliest catch. I'm watching it on Discovery Channel. Like that's by far one of the most dangerous jobs. There's some honor in that. And I almost settled on that. When the other idea popped into my brain, like, wait, no, why can't I go join the military? And not just that, I wanna be a part of the most elite. I wanna be a US Navy SEAL. And so my first order of business is this. If I'm gonna be a frog man, I don't need to go to school anymore. Started my truck up and took off out of that school parking lot. <laughs> Never took those tests. And of course, I gotta let my dad know some bad news and good news as I phrased it. So I kind of let him know what's going on at school, not really passing any of the classes. And of course, he's kind of face palming like, oh, the good news, hey, it's all right, dad, I got a plan. I'm gonna be a Navy SEAL. And so I'm just doing the preparation, all the running and swimming. And as days go by, he invites me inside one day up into his room. He says, okay, so you really wanna do this, huh? You wanna be a SEAL? I'm like, yeah, dad, I wanna be a SEAL. He goes, great. I set up a workout for you with the Navy SEAL. Check out my computer screen. And I'll never forget, as I'm looking over the computer, my thought is, my dad doesn't have any Navy SEAL friends. Like, who is this? And I see in this email just says, can Chad come out and play tomorrow? I'm like, play? Like, dad, let me get this straight. You, you met some guy off the internet, says he wants to play with me, and you're arranging all this right now. <laughs> I was like, all right, I guess, you know, I'm gonna go meet up with the guy. And so as it turns out, there's more of a conversation he had with this man on the phone that I had no, like I had no knowledge of prior to that email. So as it turns out on the phone, he gets on the phone with this guy, says, hey, look, my son wants to be a Navy SEAL, but here's the deal. He has no idea what he's getting involved in. He doesn't know what he's signing up for. So I'm just asking, could you do me a really big favor? I, I need you to meet up with my son. And what I'm asking you to do, I need you to crush him. Give him a wake-up call. Just bury him. Beat this desire of becoming a seal out of him. So, the guy thought about it for a while, and he decides to reply back in the email, can Chad come out and play tomorrow? So I don't know what that is all about, but I'm about to go find out. As I meet up with this Navy SEAL in a beach parking lot, he spots me right away. You Chad? Yes, sir. All right, Bubba. I was Bubba from that point forward. Get on over here. He's got me dropped down, doing push-ups and sit-ups. He brings a portable pull-up bar you can hang from anywhere. So I'm doing pull-ups outside the bathroom, like at the beach in front of people. I'm kind of hanging in there. I'm doing the things that he wants me to do. He says, all right, Bubba, why don't you go for this run, you know, 15 minutes down the trail, out into the wetlands and uh, away from the ocean. And 15 minutes into it, you take over and then I'll be there with you 15 minutes into the run. At the time, I'm like this little wiry guy. I'm like a gazelle, 15 minutes into the run. I'm taking off on this guy. And so I'm leaving him in the dust, he's gone, I don't see him. And I'm looking over my shoulder thinking, ah, and like, hey, maybe I'm too fast for this Navy SEAL. He can't catch up on the run. And I'm thinking of the names of my friends I was gonna be bragging to as I'm looking over my shoulder again, and it's like a scene cut right out of Terminator 2. You remember the bad guy that can like morph into knife hands and chase down a moving vehicle? <laughs> That's the SEAL coming at me with knife hands, like a T-1000, right? There's nothing I could do. He closes that gap. I'm thinking we're just in a foot race, right? He passes me by and I never saw what was coming next as he just plants down, pivots, turns, and I'm greeted by his fist, just impaling my stomach as I'm going for the ride, just clothesline, wind knocked out of me before my back even hit the ground. I just see sky poofing dirt up all around me and you gotta put yourself in my shoes for a moment here. Cause remember the only intel at the time I had was this, some guy, my dad met off the internet, he's got me on the ground in the wetlands. Like I'm thinking child predator, this is happening. 
He is jumping on top of me and just ragdolling me. I still remember that sound of the threads of my shirt just going, ripping, spit flying out of his mouth. He's screaming in my face, going ballistic. I feel like, yeah, the cheek, the forehead. And <laughs> then these words come through. You wanna be a Navy SEAL? You better stay three paces behind me. There is something about that moment right there. The pain for a moment went away. Time froze. I knew if I quit right now, I'll forever be a quitter. Like this is the moment, Chad. If you quit right now, you will forever be a quitter. The way you respond here is going to affect the trajectory of the rest of your life. And he gets up and says it again, three paces and he turns and he's not letting up, he's showing no mercy. He just takes off. And I know if I quit right now, it's it. And so I'm going after this guy, I'm staying on his heels. And this went on for a handful of miles down this trail. But we finally get to a point where he, he stops, he ends it. And he circles up and he's pacing back and forth. And he breaks this really awkward tension. He just goes, hey, if we would have gone another mile or two, would you have stayed with me? And I just told him, it's like, Scott, I'll die before I quit. Well, he just gets this big smile on his face, completely changes his demeanor. This is it, he goes, great, hey, you want to meet up again for the workout tomorrow? <laughs> So from that day forward, I began to meet up with this Navy SEAL, and thankfully it was no longer these beat down sessions. It became more of a, a building up. In fact, I moved on in life from just being Bubba to eventually I became Junior. He really took me under his wing <laughs> as he's looking out after me. He is the youngest man to ever make it through SEAL training. He finished it by the time he was 17 years old. He's a world champion pan-athlete. He's the fastest Navy SEAL on the SEAL training obstacle course. And so you can imagine what it's like to be me, you know, to get trained up by this guy. And as time went on, he got me ready. So I sign up, I got a date, it's set, I'm going off now to boot camp. Scott takes an opportunity, as he put it, to go overseas again. It's gonna be a very quick turnaround. He's actually leaving before I leave off to boot camp. So he's getting on the phone with me for one last phone call before he goes. He says, all right, Junior. And he says, I just want you to know something though that I've never told anybody that I've ever trained before. And so that right there really cued me in, like important words coming next. And he says, I know you're gonna make it through SEAL training. And to hear like that type of vote of confidence from him, it, it, I, I'll never have the words to like really put it into words, right? Like that just meant the world to me. I couldn't wait for my opportunity to, like, to prove him right, to make him proud, and just to do this thing that I've wanted to do from the very beginning now. So when I actually start SEAL training in Coronado, San Diego, he says, I'll be back. I'm gonna be there by your side. We're gonna see you make it through. So we say our goodbyes. Can't wait to see you to get back, Scott. So he's gone. I'm excited about to get this thing going. Just for the time's sake, I guess the numbers do speak for themselves. SEAL training, I started the class of 173 guys. By graduation day, only 13 of that original class number still standing there. So I'm up one day, television on in the background, and I remember looking over the screen like I can't believe what I just, I'm seeing on the screen. Cause I'm looking at a picture of Scott smiling. I'm just looking at the profile shot. And that's when I see in the lower third of the screen, Scott's birth date followed by a dash, and it says March 31st, 2004. And before I could process in my mind, like what that means, I didn't have an opportunity. Cause then it switches from the smiling image of him to graphic video footage of a vehicle burning in the background, which was the vehicle that he was in, along with three other Americans, as their vehicle was ambushed by a group of insurgents that videotaped everything that they were doing. I went through all the different emotions. And revenge is a fuel. It's not a good fuel to live off of, but it is a fuel. So it's just one of those things, you just don't go forward the same person from there. Look back to that day in the parking lot. Man, if I could just become a SEAL, I thought, oh, you know, that would be a fuel I could live off of and burn on for the rest of my life. And then on top of all that, doing it in honor and memory of my mentor, who was really his, his name on the inside of my hat. But I do think that there is a takeaway for all of us, and it has to do with dealing with adversity. See, a lot of times the adversity that we face has to do with outside circumstances that we literally have no control over. You have no control over it. Everyone here has faced adversity, at least to some degree. And here's the thing, is it's not a singular event, is it? It's imminent that there will be more. Nobody's immune to that. And so you have to kind of prepare yourself in a way ahead of time. Like realize that you are going to face more adversity. It's not an if, it's a when. So if you have no control over that, what's the one thing you do have control over? You control the way that you respond. You are the determiner of if that adversity is going to be what we can ultimately call a wing or a weight. 
Will you allow it to be a weight that just sinks you, leaves you knocked down, never to get back up again? People just say, that's it, they're out for the count, they're never coming back from that one. Or do you find a wing in there somehow, it's just a way to rise to the occasion. So our SEAL Creed, it says forged by adversity. You will either fail because of adversity or you will be forged by adversity. It is the worst mistake you will ever make. And I wish I had someone who could just pull me aside and say, hey, it's gonna be okay. It's gonna be okay. But I wish I knew that.